The summer of 2020 brought to the surface many issues in our society. While most people's eyes were on the US and the inhumane treatment and eventual murder of George Floyd, not to mention Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and Rayshard Brooks, these were all unarmed African-Americans killed by white police officers. And then there were protests that followed and all in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic. All of these incidents made it clear that the time for a global reckoning for centuries of anti-Black racism was now. Canada was no exception. But here's the difference. When a Black person is killed by police, the feeling in Canada is, was, and it actually has been for quite some time, that Black people are suddenly headline news in Canada's media when we aren't on a regular basis. During the summer of 2020, Many Canadian producers asked me, actually, to speak about what's going on in the U.S. But I was not called to speak on Regis Korczynski Paquette, who died while interacting with Toronto Police on May 27th, just two days after George Floyd's murder by Minneapolis Police. Nor was I asked to comment on Defonte Miller, who was assaulted on December 28th, 2016, in Whitby, Ontario, by Michael Turo, an off-duty constable of the, the Toronto Police Service, who, on November 5th, was sentenced to nine months to jail. And so the question all Canadians, I believe, have to start to reckon with is why in these moments do Black Canadian bodies take up so little space in our media while we turn all of our attention on the African-American story and their entanglements with policing? Robin Maynard's groundbreaking book, Policing Black Lives, published in 2017, gives an exhaustive account of state-sanctioned violence against Black Canadians at the hands of police in our country. Yet we are still having conversations about policing in Canada as though there isn't a long history of anti-Black racism, not solely in policing, but in the justice system itself. So with all the anti-Blackness circulating the headlines and especially on social media, I've been forced to reflect again on my experiences as a Black Canadian, born and raised right here in this country. I keep thinking about some of my childhood experiences and the ways in which racism occurred in such subtle ways. One incident happened the summer before my twin sister and I started grade five. Another set of fraternal twins had moved onto our street in the West Hill community in Scarborough. They were white. We didn't care about their race, however. We just thought it was uncanny. What a coincidence. What are the odds that two sets of twins who are the same age end up living on the same street? We welcomed them to the neighborhood. We played together almost every day and we thought we had made new friends. When school started, however, they no longer had much time to play. They were noticeably different. They were still friends with us, but they were distant. These sisters, open and accessible to us in our neighborhood, became distant and aloof in our predominantly white school. At some point, there was an assignment where we were asked to share with the class our feelings about school. One of the twins got up and said she was grateful for the new friends she had made at school because she and her sister didn't know anyone until they had arrived there. What she was saying was, was that me and my sister didn't count as friends. Just in that very instant, we had been completely erased and forgotten. While this experience is my own, it reveals how subtle anti-Blackness can be and how that which is unspoken can be just as racist as what is expressed out loud. Now, we never spoke to the twins again, but their ability to see us when they needed us and then to ignore us when they didn't need us made me think about the ways in which the city also didn't see race, and by city, I mean the city of Toronto, also didn't see race in the coronavirus pandemic until Black people pointed it out that they needed to. Eight months into this pandemic, and the question still remains, Will COVID-19 finally become the moment when white people reflect on race the same way that Black people have always had to reflect on race? The Tipping Point, published 20 years ago, uses multiple examples of social epidemics. One of them is hush puppies. 
the classic American brushed suede shoes with a light crepe sole that reached their tipping point in late 1994 and early 1995 to explain how things can spread without a knowable root cause. Where the brand had been floundering up until that point, for some unknown reason, the shoes became hip in the clubs and bars of downtown Manhattan. And just like that, hush puppies were back in vogue. The best way to understand the tipping point of a brand, crime waves, or even unexpected spikes in social behaviors is to think of them as spreading just like viruses do. No one took out an advertisement and told people that traditional hush puppies were cool. Those kids simply wore the shoes when they went to the clubs, the cafes, or walked the sidewalks of New York. And in so doing, they expressed and exposed other people to their fashion sense. They infected them with their hush puppy virus. In many ways, racism works the exact same way. It is nearly impossible to locate when somebody was infected with racist ideologies. But thanks to internet culture in the 21st century, we can now locate how racist behaviors like social epidemics can spread. While the coronavirus pandemic has conjured up rhetoric about how Canadians are all in this together. I mean, we've heard all of our leaders say this at news conferences. We are all in this together. The reality is, is, is quite different. If we take a deeper look at how the pandemic has affected the city, not just the city of Toronto, but other cities across the country, it's apparent, it's very apparent that we don't experience urban spaces in the same way. From COVID-19 to police brutality, this historical moment has revealed the ways in which Black voices often go unheard. As scholars Beverly Bain, Omi Sore, Dryden, and Ronaldo Walcott observed in a blog post on the conversation back in April of 2020, quote, Black lives are further in peril in a time of COVID-19. Subject to death on, the, on both the public health and policing fronts, we will not be silenced. Even as state public officials choose to ignore our lives and livability by insisting that race and class do not matter, the historical and contemporary evidence in this country demonstrates more than otherwise." End quote. And so while their essay was written before Korczynski Paquette's death, these words are still eerily relevant. Quote, black lives matter, end quote. That's not just a hashtag. It is a battle cry, demanding to hashtag see us as existing in the same spaces and places as everyone else, not just over the summer months, but all year round. The need for Black people and people of African descent in general to take up space across the world has never been more urgent, and cities in Canada are no different. As someone who has been trained in communication studies, that is what my PhD is in. In recent years, I've thought back to the early days of the internet and internet culture, when there were technological utopians like American media scholar Douglas Rushkoff, who believed that the new technology would create a global village where the world would become happier and freer with the advancement of technology. At the same time, Rushkoff, who is white, failed to recognize the ways in which digital technologies, in as much as they aid in the circulation of racist and sexist material and can be used to erode our civil and human rights have also empowered the marginalized black people indigenous people lgbtq plus to crash the normative system of our society that ignores them and sometimes minimizes their voices and so 2020 has been the year where we have been shown that the revolution doesn't need to be televised anymore because the hashtag does have it covered. At the end here, I just want to list some hashtags that we really need to think about and think about the lives that lay behind them and how much we don't know about the lives lived and how also they tragically died. Hashtag Andrew Loku. Hashtag Jermaine Carby. Hashtag Alex Wetlofer. Hashtag Jean Pierre Boney. Hashtag Ian Price. Hashtag Frank Anthony Berry. Hashtag Michael Elegon. Hashtag Eric Olsaway. 
Hashtag Regal Jardine Douglas. Hashtag Junior Alexander Mannion. Hashtag DeAndre Campbell. And hashtag Regis Korchinski Paquette. These are all Black Canadians who died at the hands of police. And so these Canadian Black Lives Matter. And so my hope is, is that in 2020, we start to reflect on how it is that we locate Blackness in Canada and how it is that we also exclude Black voices in Canada. Thank you.